Good evening, everybody. I'd like to encourage those of you who are standing to take a seat so we can get started almost on time. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second in this year's series of Luminary Series. And today, we will hear from one of the scientists in the University of Central Florida College of Medicine, Burnett School of Biomedical Sciences. And we're all really thrilled to see the turnout uh, that, that we have tonight for this event. And it would be remiss if I did not mention another luminary who is with us this evening. The first first lady of UCF is here. This is Frances Milliken. Would you please stand and be recognized? And if we have a first first lady, we also have a first scientist at UCF. And our first scientist is Dr. Papajan Kaladakudi, who will come up in a minute and introduce our speaker. But I just want to say, the more I read about Dr. P.K., uh, the more impressed I am with the incredible resource that was here waiting for our medical school. As you know, he built the Burnett College of Biomedical Sciences, which is now the Burnett School of Biomedical Sciences, and serves as the basic science foundation for our College of Medicine. And I was reading a little bit about him and learned that he discovered uh, that the work of one of our Nobel laureates was incorrect. And in that discovery, he was able, over time, to create a situation where that Nobel laureate became a colleague and a partner with him in future scientific work. So without any further ado, our uh, scientific leader, Dr. Kalatakudi. Thanks, Deb, for that overly generous remark. Um, I also want to thank you all, well, welcome you here for the Luminary Series, which actually was initiated by Bernadine Douglas when uh, we were in the Burnett College to give an opportunity for us to tell you about some exciting things going on in UCF in biomedical sciences. And I want to thank the sponsors, uh, the Dean Mead, and Fifth Third for resurrecting that in this form and be able to continue that format to give you an opportunity to, give us an opportunity to give you some idea about some of the things going on in the Burnett School in the College of Medicine. Uh, now, as we are moving into the time we will be occupying the Burnett School building in Lake Nona, the 200,000 square foot building that is ready for occupancy by first week of July or a little touch earlier, I cannot help but express our deep gratitude to Alan Nancy Burnett, whose generous $10 million gift, which became 20 million with the state match, that became the foundation for the biomedical science research and education enterprise. In the Burnett School, we hire faculty members who are doing research at the cutting edge with the potential application to the solution of a problem in one of the major diseases, cancer, that we will hear about today, cardiovascular disease, infectious disease, and neurodegenerative disease. The faculty members we hire depend on federal grants nationally competitive grants for their research. There is no state money to run research programs, no operational money. So all the graduate students and the postdocs and all the research personnel are paid from grants brought by these faculty members by competing at a national level. Now remember, we are competing with all the rest of the country, the Harvards and the Stanfords, and the Hopkins and the like. But the good news is our faculty members 
are successful in getting their fair, of share, their fair share of the grant. In fact, many of our faculty members have multiple federal grants, particularly the National Institute of Health, because the nature of the research we do. Now, when these faculty members stand in front of a class, they actually transmit the excitement of research, the excitement of discovery to the students, including undergraduates. That is not very often recognized or appreciated by people. When people who have experienced firsthand the thrill of discovery stand in front of a class, they really transmit that excitement. If you read a book and try to tell the class what the book said, you really cannot project the same kind of excitement if you haven't experienced firsthand the thrill of discovery. That's what drives us all. Now, the, it is, we are fortunate to have that kind of faculty and our education really gains a lot. Again, not widely appreciated. You know, we more than tripled our majors in the last five, six years. And the undergraduates get real experience in research. More than 90 undergraduates are participating in research in our laboratories, really experiencing the thrill of science, the thrill of discovery. That is really valuable for the educational process. Now, I don't want to go on too much, but let me say, when we have this kind of situation, we, you know, as an administrator, the joy you get out of it is when you see the faculty you helped to launch and nurture really thrive. Today, I have one of the best examples of that. Dr. Annette Khalid, I interviewed her some years ago in Fort Lauderdale before I physically moved here from Ohio State. And after talking to her, I got the feeling, hey, here's a winner. I want to go after her. And we were very fortunate that she decided to join us. And it was my privilege to help launch that career. Today, she is really a rising star. In this day and age, when the grant getting is so tough, super competitive, to have a young career with multiple NIH grants is a major testimony to the quality of her science. Now, I don't want to steal her thunder about her research. She will tell you that. Now, let me say, she's going to be one of the first ones to move to Lake Nona. And uh, of course, we are going to have a VA hospital. So Annette will have an opportunity to work almost next door to her husband, who is a pathologist in the VA system. So that is going to be a nice family affair. I must say, it is really heroic on her part today to be with us. She went through a real difficult time. Last week, she lost her father. And this week, she checked her mother into a home for advanced Alzheimer's disease. So it's really heroic. You hear about all these sports figures playing football when they have a personal thing. Here's a totally dedicated scientist. With all these personal situations, she's with us to share her science. Now, without any more delay, I present to you Dr. Annette Khalid. Annette. <laughs> Thank you so much for that really kind and generous introduction. And I really want to share with you what we're doing today in the lab, which, as PK says, it's amazing work. And the environment at UCF has really enabled me to do this. As I came really from my postdoc, starting my own lab, and I've been able over these years to actually do research that I'm excited about. And I'm going to talk to you about that stuff today. So again, thank you. It's a wonderful opportunity for being here. And I hope to share with you what we're doing in my lab and the excitement of what we're doing. So let me first tell you that as we're sitting here, and we all think of death and we try to avoid death. And you know, as PK told you, we've, I've been dealing with that personally in the last few weeks. But yet, death is a part of life. Death is a part of what keeps us healthy, as my title shows you here. 
Our bodies are composed of subunits that we call cells, and we have trillions of cells in our body. And yet, as we sit here right now, you may not be aware of this, but about three million of those cells in your body are currently dying or undergoing death. And that process is essential for us to be functional, healthy human beings. So why do these cells die? That's, that's the question that we all ask. Why do our cells die inappropriately or appropriately? Well, there's several reasons. One, for example, is simple renewal. Old cells die, new cells take their place. It's a normal process that occurs in our bodies. We also need to get rid of cells. Sometimes cells are infected by pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and they also get damaged. We have to remove them. So that's part of the process of getting rid of cells, why cells die. But also we have to remove cells when there are not enough of them. We have too many of them. We have excess cells. And let me give you an example of this last one. For example, when we're developing as a fetus, our hands look like this. They look little webs. And during the developmental process, the cells that are in between our fingers, they will die. So that we will sculpt our hands to eventually have five fingers and a normal hand. So shown here in yellow, you can see these are the cells that are dying as we're developing so that we have a normal functional hand. Now, when things go wrong, when cells don't die when they should, things like this can happen where this individual has actually fused fingers because there was no cell death of those cells between those fingers. So leading to my next point is that if we have problems with this normal process of cells dying, we have disease. Cancer is an example of that. We have cancer be many times because these cells that would normally die and not cause problems to our body, they don't. They stay around, they grow inappropriately, and they eventually form some sort of cancer in the body. But other diseases, the neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, AIDS, as well as conditions of heart failure, can also occur when cell death is occurring and when you don't want it to happen inappropriately. So here's an example, for example, of two children, and they're suffering from a disease that we call autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, or ALPS. And these children will actually die at a very young age, maybe not even reaching their teenage, because you can see here these large nodules, these are cells that normally should have died when after you have a normal infection, and they didn't. And this individual then has these large nodules that eventually will lead to their death in a very, unfortunately, short period of time. So the point that I really want to make here is that death is part of life. Death is part of us. And what keeps us healthy and what keeps us functioning is when this process occurs in a reasonable, normal fashion. When it doesn't, then we have problems. So let me go now, since I'm a scientist, I want to tell you a little bit about what scientists believe is happening during this death process. So we call this death process apoptosis. It's a Greek term. It actually means falling, like petals falling from a flower, leaves falling from a tree. In science, we use this term to signify a program, a process that occurs in a sequential series of steps, almost like a cell suicide program. Now, this is a little movie. I really want to point out to you the cell right here. These are all different cells, and they're growing in a solution that's very similar to the blood. They're growing in an incubator that has all the similar conditions of temperature, oxygen, CO2, like our bodies. And the red is actually highlighting just the surface structure. But if you can see here, you see this little green cell. Do you see how it balled up? And now you're going to see it actually form this little ball and run around. That cell just died. That's a dead cell. It died because the green signifies a protein. Proteins are products that cells make to function. So we actually introduced a protein into the cell that caused that cell to die. Now, what is that protein? Well, that protein that we introduce is the one that we study in my lab, and we call that protein BAX, B-A-X. So you see BAX here in the schematic, and it normally resides in most of the cells in our body. We all carry BAX, and BAX is usually dormant. Now, the counterpoint to BAX, BAX kills cells, the counterpoint to BAX is another protein called BCL2. BCL2 is like a guardian. It actually sits at the surface of uh, what we call an organelle, which is a structure found within a cell. And this structure, the mitochondria, is an energy factory. It produces the energy that a cell needs for its daily functions. 
So BCL2 is like a sentinel that sits at the mitochondria and it keeps the mitochondria intact, functioning and producing energy. But what happens when the cell receives a signal that tells it it's your time to die? Well, what happens is Bax no longer is dormant, it becomes activated, and it actually moves from a location within the cell and targets the mitochondria. And within the mitochondria, when it does that, it forms a pore or holes within the mitochondria. And that allows little factors that will re normally reside inside the mitochondria to be released. These factors form complexes that end up destroying many of the substrates that are found inside the cell. As a result, that cell dies. So that little picture I showed you before, the little green cell balling up, well, that's what happens. This is the cell. These are different mitochondria. They're being attacked by Bax. And when that happens, that cell self-destructs, breaks down into little balls like this. And then in the body, there's a mechanism where you have scavenger cells, like a little Pac-Man, will come through and will eat up all that residue left over of the dead cells. And the end result is that cell died. Those three million cells that are dying every second are doing this. That cell died, and the debris was cleaned up. So that's what normally happens. What about the other trillion cells in your body that are not dying? Well, what happens there is that our friend BCL2, the guardian, if Bax gets activated inappropriately, it's not, the, the cell did not receive a death signal, it does happen once in a while, it's there to protect the cell from Bax and keep that cell alive, keep the mitochondria functioning, making energy, and that cell still stays alive. So that's the normal mechanism. That's what's happening in our bodies all the time under normal conditions. Now, in cancer, obviously, there are problems, and we need to develop drugs that will help destroy and kill these cancer cells. So I want to point out just some of the current drugs that are being made. What's the problem with them? This is a drug, for example, Eresa, that's made for lung cancer. And actually, I copied this from the last clinical trial, and it basically says that a large study that this drug does not make people live longer. So it really doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Here's another drug. This drug will actually reduce the risk of breast cancer, but at the cost of having congestive heart failure. So you have a drug that works, but it's causing a problem, so it has side effects. Here's another one that was a combination therapy, and the result of that study said it actually shortened the patient's survival. It was not good. It did not function the way it should. So there are lots of good drugs out there that do their job, but unfortunately, there's not enough of them. We don't have enough drug therapies that actually can target cancer and, and cure it or eliminate it at the rate that we need to. So what are we trying to do? Well, normally, as I said, when a cell receives a death signal, this is a normal, healthy cell. It will undergo the process of apoptosis or cell death. And if you use, for example, chemotherapy or radiotherapy, some sort of drug to kill that cell, this is what we want to happen. We want BACs to be activated. We want complexes to form that will destroy the cell and to have that, that cancer cell, for example, die. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't happen, as I said. What happens very frequently, if this is a cancer cell, here's the mitochondria of a cancer cell, that cancer cell will make tons of the BCL2, the guardian. It'll overexpress it, make a much more larger amount than what's normally found. And of course, when you activate Bax, Bax can't do anything. There's too much BCL2 around. Also, you can have problems with Bax itself. Sometimes cancers will mutate Bax, so Bax doesn't work at all. So these are problems with the current methods of drugs that, that are targeting cancer cells. If you have defects in BCL2, you have defects in Bax, these drugs are not going to work. Another problem is that not every cancer is the same, as we all know. Every, I've listed here different forms of cancer, lung, liver, thyroid, brain, pancreas. All these cancers are different. They all have different defects. If you develop a drug that, for example, targets BCL2, as I said, BCL2 overexpression is a common problem in cancer. It's not going to work for other cancers that have different defects. So how do you generate a cure for cancer, a treatment for cancer, when you have all these obstacles? Well, what we're trying to do in our lab is to use what we know about how apoptosis normally happens in a cell and try to figure out how we can develop what we call a biologic a treatment based on the biology of these BCL2 and Bax proteins that we can use to cause apoptosis in a cancer cell. And that's basically what I'm going to talk to you about. So let me show you another movie. 
you're going to see a green cell here, and that green cell is going to undergo apoptosis. So you watch it for a moment. Here it is. You can see it moving around in the solution. And after a few minutes, you're going to start to see it shrink and literally break apart into little pieces. Very similar to what you saw in the first movie of that green cell that I showed you in the field of red cells. The difference is that we achieve this by only giving the cell a very, very small piece of Bax. Bax is a protein that has maybe about 200 subunits. We only introduce 20 of those subunits into this cell. And we were able to cause that cell to die by apoptosis in a very similar mechanism as we saw in the previous movie. So, what we're trying to do is shown here. Here's a cell, here's a mitochondria, here's our BACs, here's our BCL2. We want to be able to introduce what we call BACs peptide. It's a very small piece of BACs. That cell that I'm showing you here in the schematic has not received a death signal. It doesn't know that it should die. Okay? But by giving it this Bax peptide, we've tricked it. We've made that cell die. We've caused that cell to activate Bax, and Bax then goes, does its job, creates complexes that will eventually destroy and kill that cell, all without inducing a signal to tell that cell to die in the first place. So if it's this with a cancer cell, we've tricked that cancer cell and made that cancer cell die. But even more importantly, we need to be able to do this to a cancer cell that has a problem in this mechanism by which it's going to die. So for example, a cell that has a defect in Bax, we want to be able to give it this Bax peptide that we're, we're developing and have that Bax, Bax peptide directly target the mitochondria and kill that cell without having to have a functional Bax present. As I said, many cancers have defects in Bax or overexpressed BCL2. And having a peptide that doesn't need any of those mechanisms in place, we can kill that cancer cell as well. So let me show you a little bit of movie here. Let me go ahead and start that one. This is Bax. This is Bax based on a computer model that we've acquired from structural information. And Bax has two ends to it. Here's one end. You're going to see the other end of it here. And here in green, what you're going to see as this model turns around, is that small Bax peptide that we're studying and using to induce cell death of cancer cells. This, pep this little piece of Bax, we call the Bax peptide, actually rests inside a small groove or cleft in Bax itself. And you can see here. And at one end, we've identified a site that we can use to change this Bax peptide and have it have different activities. Here's the groove shown here. And you can see as it turns around, this groove, as it turns around, the groove will show you Bax resting, the Bax peptide resting in this little groove. Now, in this case, the Bax peptide, in this case, is not really a peptide. It's actually part of Bax, and that's shown here. It's actually attached to it at this loop region. But using computer modeling, we actually learned that, and that's the same picture shown up here, that this small piece of Bax, which is actually at the very end of Bax, when we release it and leave it, let it uh, free, for example, as the Bax peptide, this small piece actually binds very differently in the groove. So when this piece is attached to Bax, it binds in a forward orientation. When it's reversed, it binds in a reversed orientation. But the reason for this, this uh, reverse binding is the importance of the finding is that it binds much more tightly. This is a very loose association. When the peptide is free, it's a much stronger association. And we think that's the reason why, when we give cells the Bax peptide by itself, we get those cells to die. So other techniques that we use besides computer modeling? Well, we use structural studies, and showing you here some machinery that we use in the lab. And these structural studies enable us to study how the Bax peptide interacts with, for example, a mitochondria. This, for example, could be part of the structure of the mitochondria. And using these techniques, we can determine the insertion rate, the depth of insertion, the angle of insertion, how it interacts with the mitochondria. All this information helps us design a better Bax peptide to do the things that we want it to do. And I'll give you some more examples here. This is a Bax peptide that we designed using computational modeling and biophysics. 
And you can see the green cells here. We slightly altered the structure of this Bax peptide. And what you're going to see is these green cells here. You're not going to see much happening. Remember the previous picture I showed you of the Bax peptide? That cell basically broke apart little pieces, underwent apoptosis. Now these cells, they're just sitting here. They're green, they're expressing the Bax peptide, but they're not doing anything. We've altered the Bax peptide, so now it no longer causes apoptosis. Now this, shown over here, don't start yet, is a very different scenario. In this case, we've expressed another variant of the Bax peptide, but now these cells don't have any functional Bax. Remember I was telling you before that one of our goals is to design a Bax peptide that can kill cells even when Bax is not around. You can see here the cell that was expressing this version of Bax basically just blebbed away, broke apart into a bunch of little pieces, and not much of it is left. So we've moved forward now to be able to design a new version of the Bax peptide that can kill cells even when Bax is not active or the, the normal Bax is not active. So what else are we working on besides designing these new peptides that will kill cancer cells? Well, we're trying to design the Bax peptides not only to kill cells, but made to also prevent cells from dying. Remember, one of the variants that we designed doesn't cause cell death at all. So why would we want to do that? Well, as I said, there's a number of diseases where you have too much cell death occurring. Heart failure, Parkinson's, stroke, Alzheimer's, autoimmune diseases, these are all examples where cells are dying when we don't want them to die. We might be able to design a version of the Bax peptide that can be protective and protect these cells from undergoing cell death. So again, these are all directions of the research that we have in our lab. What else? Well, there's a lot more to do. Besides designing these back peptides to do the things that we want to do, either kill cells or not kill cells, there's a lot of things that we are also working on. For example, trying to make these peptides stable. It's a very important point because a peptide will lose its structure when it's in water. So we actually want to develop peptides that will be stable in water that we can use for injections or use for treatment. We have to deliver them to the right cells. Either the apoptotic cells have to be the, delivered the protective Bax peptide, or a cancer cell has to be delivered the toxic Bax peptide. And we also want to prevent adjacent cells that are healthy from being damaged. For example, if we give them the toxic Bax peptide. So all these things are things that we're developing and we're working on the lab to different degrees to eventually generate a product that can be used within a clinical setting. So let me tell you a little about the people who are doing this work. Again, this is an interdisciplinary project. I'm an immunologist, so I bring in people who have expertise. For example, in computational modeling, this is a graduate student that was in my lab for a few years. She's now moved on to be a postdoc in Germany, but she developed many of the models that we're using right now to design peptides. Kathleen Nemec is a postdoc scientist in my lab. She's a biophysicist, and she's doing a lot of the structural studies that help us understand how these different Bax peptides work. And other students in my lab, and again, student training is a very important uh, element of my research lab. And so I have different students who are doing aspects. For example, most of the movies that you saw today were done by Rebecca. And a lot of the basic biology and molecular biology that we do was done by Gu and Adina. And these scientists all come together, and we can produce amazing work thanks to all their different levels of expertise. And let's let me stop at this point and acknowledge a few other people. We have other projects in the lab, and I have other students working on these projects. Christina, Lanier, and Shannon are all working on different aspects of the more uh, immunological projects that I work on. My collaborators, especially Sarin Tatulian, who's a biophysicist who has helped tremendously in, in a lot of the BACS work. Uh, my mentor at NCI, Scott Durham, and Larry Flegel, who has helped us with a pH project that we have in the lab. And most importantly, I want to thank NIH for funding us over the years.